Heavenly Father, you've heard my voice many times this week. You have heard it multiple times today. I ask you, Lord God, that through the what even your word calls the foolishness of preaching, may you move rocks, stones. May you make the dead alive. May you, may you speak, may you call, may you save. May you take people to a higher ground, a higher walk with you. For some, Lord God, you bring them back to where they left in order to take them higher. You do what you do. Anoint me. May this be you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let, here, listen to the words from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Down in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be trouble, troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Back up to verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I've underlined that very strong. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know and the way you know. Thomas doesn't know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. That part about preparing the place jumped out at me because in John, I realized that John is constantly connecting whatever Jesus says with the religious celebration or, and all that goes with it. This is the Passover. It's the Passover night. Jesus had already sent Peter and John to that room to prepare for the Passover. The blood is on the door, on the sides and on the top. The lamb without spot is slain and prepared and ready to eat on the table. The bread, the unleavened bread, is before them. Everything they had prepared for, Jesus has done the same. The Passover was the most terrifying night for the Israelites, the first one. Nine plagues. They had been lived 400 years basically not knowing who God was. 400 years living in Egypt, one generation after another, forgetting their roots and forgetting who God was. So much so that when God calls Moses and he sends Moses to them, Moses has to start from scratch. They're going to have to be taught what it is to know who Jesus is. They're going to have to be taught to know what it is to worship him. They've got to learn. They don't know the truth. They don't know the way. They don't know what life is. They've lived as slaves for 400 years without any guidance. The only thing that they're holding on to is who their grandpa was. Abraham. And that's it. And it wasn't enough. And so Jesus, God, is going to take them from where they were to another place. And so on that ter terrible night, after nine plagues, after the plague of blood, of frogs, lice, flies, death of the beast, boils, hail, locusts, and a night of darkness. Now Moses declares, death is coming. I challenge you to do a search. Don't you ever do this in my presence. If I, you do, I will smick, smirk, snork, smell. Ah. I will look funny at you. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture does it say, and I've looked in the different translations and I've done a search everywhere I can find, there is no death angel. In Exodus, clearly it says, I, the Lord, will pass over. I, the Lord, 
pass over. You see, none of the plagues were caused by an angel. All the plagues were about God. This, God was not trying to create a sense of awe and reverence and fear in some angels. God was creating a sense of fear, a new understanding. He was giving them a new spirit of truth about who God was. A God that they hadn't known for 400 years. God is re-educating not only Egypt, but Israel. Because they don't know. And so they've seen the nine plagues when the Lord can came upon the nation. But on this night, it's not just the Lord hand and it's not just a command from the Lord's prophet. On this night, only on this night, the Lord himself will pass through Egypt. And any firstborn child that is not under the blood will die. So... Israel gathers under those in their houses. They make sure they put the blood up. It is a terrifying night. It is a frightful night. They are filled with anxiety. They are filled with fear. And yet, Moses is telling them, under the blood, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear under the blood. Amen. Amen. You stay under the blood. You stay in his house. You stay where you're supposed to be. You don't wander. You stay next to him. You stay under the blood. And there is nothing, nothing to fear. With that understanding, Jesus starts out and says, It's the Passover night. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be like your ancestors. You know something. You have celebrated Passovers over and over before. There is no reason for you to be in fear. There's no reason for you to lack peace. The Passover was also the beginning of a new year. Literally, a new Jewish calendar started with that first Passover. In Exodus, when it says, God tells them, it says, this is the Passover night. When this night is over, you will begin, you will begin. This will be the first month of your new year. It is a total new life. For the people of God. Not only that, the next morning, they're going to go on a journey on a way that they do not know, on a path and a direction they do not know. But God is not going to leave them alone. The Lord Himself is going to lead them by a cloud by day and a pillar of light by night. He is going to lead them. It is a journey to a place a prepared place, a promised place, a place that is in waiting, a place of life, a place of an abundance. Do you understand? It's the Passover. Do you understand that when you quote John 1, 14, 6, you skip over all of the other stuff? Jesus is trying to tell us clearly that we have no need be troubled if if we believe so what is this peace well let me tell you what it's not it's not the absence of war in fact Jesus clearly said there are going to be wars and rumors of war all the way up until I come and then there's going to be the Armageddon so this peace that God promises is not an absence of war it's not an absence of family strife how many times have I counseled with individuals where the husband or the wife are trying to live for the Lord and the other one is at war with the other they're constantly at battle Jesus promised that he would, his parent presence in your life would be a sword, that he would literally divide mothers against daughters, daughters against mothers, wives against husbands, husbands against wives. This peace is not about the absence of family strife. It is not about the absence of persecution. If they persecuted him, he said, they will persecute you. It's not the absence of storms. Literally, we have seen in the Gospel of John that Jesus, God, has no problem in creating storms and then sending you into them. This peace is not about the absence of storms. And it's not about the absence of trials. 
According to James chapter 1, the trials come and He allows them to come before, because they perfect us, complete us, lacking nothing. I can't be what He wants without the trials. It's not an absence of sickness and suffering. We may not be of this world, but we live in this world. Our bodies are promised and are being made new, but we still live in this rotten, decaying, aging body. That's what it's not. So what is it? Is that incredible? And some of you will understand this. Some of you are just going to have to hopefully get it before you leave here. It's that incredible sense of calm, confident assurance that only Jesus can offer in the midst of war, in the midst of family strife, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials, in the midst of storms, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of sickness. That peace is only found in the prepared place under the blood. So how do you get it? Well, long before you get to John chapter 14, verse 6, he tells you, you better believe not just in a God. You better believe in Jesus. There will be many in hell who believed in a God and many in hell who believed in many gods. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. And I said it early and I say it again. It's not about... You see, Jesus as Savior only comes when Jesus becomes your Lord. It's called repentance. It's called change. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, God talks about a worldly sorrow, a sorrow that the world offers where you feel bad about your sin. You can name your sins. You will even have a prayer and confess your sins, but you never deal with the sin. You see, it wasn't the apple. The rich young ruler had done all of the Ten Commandments. But both Adam and Eve, the rich man, Nicodemus, the Ethiopian eunuch, and every man and woman that's ever been created has battled not just against sins, but who's going to be Lord over their life? Adam and Eve did not want to obey God. They wanted to be their own Lord. The rich young ruler, he done all ten of the commandments, but Jesus knew quickly, no, there's a lordship issue. You go sell everything and you come follow me. Nicodemus, had a little checklist. You got to start all over. You got to follow me. Ethiopian eunuch, he's at the temple, just left. He's been worshiping. You got to follow Jesus. So, he's gone to prepare a promised place, a perpetual place, a personal place, prepared place. We call it heaven, but it's my destination. Now, how do I get there? The way. The only way. And it's Jesus. You'll never be good enough. You can never do enough to wipe away even one of your sins, much less all of your sins. 
you can get wet a hundred times, a thousand times, and it will not wash away your sin. Lordship has always been the biggest confession in Scripture. So what about you? You have a nail in a short place, a nail called Jesus. Have you wanted salvation but not a Lord? You can't have the salvation without a Lord. Perhaps this morning, something you have seen, heard, perhaps the Holy Spirit, well, not perhaps, pray, pray that it's the Holy Spirit drawing you to the way, to the only truth, and to the only life that can be real. I don't know what that looks like for you. Perhaps it won't even be for you. Maybe you will be consumed with the agony that you have someone that's not under the blood. Not in a safe place. Not with Jesus. Maybe that'll be who you will pray for. But if it's your day to say, Jesus, I'm done with this wrestle. I'm done with this fighting. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Lord. Salvation is the gift, but I want you to be my Lord. And I'm going to follow you today. And I'm going to do it in baptism. If that's you, and you need to move over in the direction of Randy and Margie and wait there until the invitation finishes, and I will move to you. Others will come. I've asked, I'm asking the deacons and the youth leaders and children leader, if you see any of them over there, I want you to do a couple things. One, I want you, look, my goal when I talk to someone all ultimately is to make sure that they're saved. But you know what, my, what I believe my conviction is? That when they finish meet with me, that they're closer to the Lord than they were when they got to me. And so I'm asking the deacons, wives, any, the youth leaders, children leaders, if you see people moving over there or up here, you move to them. You make sure when you leave them that they're closer to the Lord than they were when you got there. If that ends up being salvation, wonderful. But if it's a higher ground, then wonderful. If it's a rededication, wonderful. But you make sure when you leave them, that they're closer to the Lord than when they left. So you're going to listen. Then you're going to pray. And then you're going to ask for godly counsel. So let's stand. Praise team. You do what you need to do here at the altar. If, it, if God's calling you to be baptized, then you move over that way. God's been already speaking to several of you. I know he did it early on, and some of you are still wrestling. Some of you have shared with me this week. Some of you haven't talked with me, but it's obvious God is still dealing with you. Put, hit the nail. Put it in the sure place. Let Jesus be your nail. Grab a hold of him this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus.